this chapter, we will be looking at polynomial functions. In this lesson, we will be looking at the characteristics of polynomial functions. Okay, well, to start off the lesson here, we're going to take a look at what a polynomial function is. Now, prior to this moment, you, you've dealt with polynomials before, um, but your, our definition of, of the pol word polynomial is a little bit loose in, in earlier grades here. Now we're going to be a little bit more specific, okay? So let's just kind of zoom, whoops, wrong way. Let's zoom in a little bit here. So a polynomial is written in the form, okay, p of x, so our polynomial, which is a function of x, will be a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 a sub 2 x squared plus a sub 1 x plus a naught. Okay, this is the form. Now, again, we've only got the one variable in there, but to, to decreasing powers, okay? And the n here, the exponent in particular, uh, would be just natural numbers. Sorry, not whole numbers, whole numbers, because we, we would include zero in there as well. And the a, now, don't, don't get thrown off by this notation here. a sub n simply means, like, for example, if I had a sub 5 here, that simply means that it would be the coefficient of the x to the fifth term. Okay, it, the, the 5 down here, or the, the index here, really doesn't have any bearing on the value of the variable there, a n. It just tells you which one it is. And they can be any real numbers. So a polynomial is basically just powers of x with real number coefficients. That's it. Okay, but it's important to understand, first of all, it contains only, yoink, only the operations, multiplication, addition, uh, with real numbers and variables. Now, <coughs> sorry, granted you might see subtraction in there, but oftentimes we'll think of that as adding adding a negative as opposed to specifically subtraction. Another point here, the exponents must be positive whole numbers, okay? Usually written in descending order. You'll like it more if you write it descending order. In fact, if they give you a question that's not in ascending order, you, sorry, our descending order, you might want to rearrange it so that you have the highest degree term first and then it drops down. Uh, there are lots of reasons why that's a good idea, okay? And then finally here, the graphs of polynomial functions are continuous, okay? So there's no, there's no breaks and there's no jumps, there's no holes. They're just these nice smooth lines that are always kind of continuously um, connected to one another. So the things that we want to avoid here Okay, so examples of things that are not polynomial functions. Well, let's take a look at this first one here. As soon as you've got an exponent that's negative, not a polynomial function. Okay, the absolute value of a function. <coughs> well, that's not really polynomial either. And the reason for that is this actually causes the, the function to break into two pieces here. And it, it just, I mean, granted, the pieces might be polynomial, but the fact that you're piecing them together, there's a little bit more going on here. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, here, this is a rational expression. As soon as you got something in the denominator, then there's nothing wrong with that. But it's not polynomial, right? If there's something in the denominator, there's a, particularly an x value in the denominator, not polynomial. Sorry, not polynomial. Uh, here, the issue is the x in the exponent. This is actually exponential. Okay, over here. In fact, I should give it some names here. This would be rational, and actually, so would the first one here, back here. This would also be rational. Uh, this is the absolute value. That's kind of its own little thing here. And then over here, okay, I've got the square root of x to the fifth. Okay, well, I can't simplify that and get a nice number. Like, there's no way that I can completely take those the x variables here out of that radical. And so this is going to be a radical function. Okay, because my exponent here on the x uh, could only ever be a rational. This is the same as x to the 5 halves, if you remember that from, from math 10. So these are all examples of, of expressions, functions, that aren't polynomial functions. Now down here, these guys are going to be examples of polynomial functions. y equals 2x minus 1, okay? Nice, simple, nothing weird going on. The exponent on the x is 1. Here it's squared to the 1 and down, uh, down to just our constant. Here's cubic. Now notice I don't have to have, I started the cubic here, I don't have to have all of the terms. In fact, I could very easily have just had y equals x cubed, and that would have been enough. Okay? Or I don't even need to have a variable in there. y equals 4, it's just a constant function. 
I don't even need to multiply them out necessarily. This is in factored form, okay? And that's okay. As long as, just take a look at this, it would be x multiplied by x multiplied by x, so that would be x cubed here. As long as we're not getting any negative exponents or rational exponents, we're good. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, a few other things here. Just uh, other little details that we need to talk about. So, the degree. The degree is the highest exponent on a variable, okay, in the polynomial. This is called the degree of the polynomial. So, so I can see, for example, I can see this guy right here. I've got x cubed, x squared, x. The largest exponent there, and this is to the one, the largest exponent is three. So this is the dominant term in this polynomial. So this would be called a cubic, okay? Its degree is going to be three. Now, in Math 30-2, we're only going to work with degree 0, 1, and 2, sorry, 0, 1, and 2, and 3 polynomial functions. Uh, it's not even so much that, that it, it gets that much harder beyond that. It's just that some of the ideas start to repeat, and there's really no point. Okay, so this is about as complicated as they need to get to, to have a really good sense of, of what's going on in these uh, polynomial expressions. Now, so having said that, just a little bit of vocabulary here. We're looking at a constant function, a linear function, quadratic, and cupid. So, <laughs> cupid, <laughs> cubic. Sorry, that's embarrassing. Anyway, so the constant function is going to be an equation. It's just y equals a number, and it's going to have degree zero. Okay, and the reason why it's degree zero is think about it like this. Down here in our linear function, we would have ax plus b. Uh, to have an x sitting there all by itself, you might put a one there up here. You might think of it as having an x to the zero there. Now, re now remember though, the x to the zero is just one, and one times the number is going to be itself. So that's why this is considered to be a degree of zero because the if you don't see the variable, it's probably because there's a zero in its exponent and it's no longer showing up. Okay, our quadratic function is going to be a degree two. Our cubic function will be degree three. So these are what they generally look like. Okay, degree zero, one, two, three. So Again, constant, linear, quadratic, cubic. And then just here's some examples. Just a number, x plus 1, x squared minus x minus 2, x cubed plus 4x squared plus x minus 6. Okay. Now, some other things that you should be aware of. Okay, a couple of ideas that you should be really quite familiar with up to this point. You've seen this a lot uh, in high school, the x-intercept is the point where it crosses the x-axis. Now, typically you're gonna find that by setting y equal to zero and solving, and I'm using the word solving kind of loosely, uh, solving for, oh sorry, I'm sorry, not in this case. In this case, I'm using it quite literally, and solving for x, because as soon as you make y equal to zero or the, the p of x equal to zero, you are creating an equation that needs to be solved. So that is exactly what you're gonna do. You're gonna solve for x. Now. That can be, okay, bear in mind here, that this can be really hard. It can be very difficult to do that. Fortunately, the graphing calculator makes that a heck of a lot easier. The y-intercept is the point in which it co uh, crosses the y-axis. Now, when you've expanded the equation out, that's going to be the constant. So, for example, up here, if I can just take a look at this. So, the y-intercept here would be the 3, the constant. The y-intercept here would be the 1. Here, the y-intercept would be the negative 2. I'm going to keep that operation with it. And down here, the y-intercept would be the negative 6. The reason for that is because to find the y-intercept, if I can come back down here, we would set x equal to 0 and evaluate. Actually, it's, it's quite simple to go through and find the y-intercept because it, it really is just a matter of following the order of operations. So here, for example, I would put a 0 in for x, so that would be 0 cubed plus four times zero squared plus zero, well, this all becomes zero and I'm simply left with negative six. Okay, good. Now, next thing we wanna look at is something called the leading coefficient. Okay, and the definition here is this is gonna be the coefficient of the greatest power of x is the leading coefficient, okay? So if we take a look at this guy right here, let's just grab our pieces here. So the leading coefficient is going to be the negative two, and I'll write that down there, negative two, because the largest degree term is cubic, and the negative two is the number in front of it. 
the degree is going to be the largest exponent, so our degree here would be 3. Our constant, which is also our y-intercept, is going to be 7. Uh, sorry, I thought there was, for a second I thought there was something else going on there, but that's it. At this point, that's all we're grabbing out of this equation here. So the leading coefficient, the degree, and the constant. Now, I'm going to want to zoom out here just a little bit and just to explain what we're getting here. At this point, you might not really understand like why we're even talking about these things. What's the significance of it? Well, one of the things that we want you to get out of this chapter here is, and what we want to build in you is a is an intuition about what these things look like. Like we want you to know graphically, okay, get a sense of what a cubic function looks like. Now, let me just explain really quickly what why these pieces are so important. The degree influences the shape of the graph. Okay, the leading coefic uh, coefficient influences the direction it moves. Okay, the direction. Okay, that'll tell us, for example, whether the graph's going up or down. So degree is a shape, leading coefficient is going to influence the direction, and, and primarily I'm talking about whether it's positive or negative. And then over here, the constant term, which gives us the y-intercept, this is basically helping us pin down a location. So you're going to have a shape, okay? It's going to be oriented in a, in a certain direction, and then we're going to pin it down to a specific location. And you'll see how these three pieces fit together here as we move on. Okay, next. Uh, we want to talk about end behavior, okay? Now when we talk about end behavior, uh, what we're talking about here, and if you just read this here, it says the end behavior of a graph describes the quadrant that the graph is in when you have large negative values of, not, sorry, large negative x values and large positive x values. Basically, as you move away from the origin to the left and the right, what quadrants are, are you in? Now, take a look, for example, here. This guy right here, this would be a cubic. And it's a cubic that goes up, okay? Now, if, if you go really, really far to the left, this graph is going to drop down and it's going to stay down. It'll keep going down, 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 but it's going to start here in the third quadrant. Now, we always read these things left to right. So you go really far left, you're going to start in the third quadrant. You slide that thing across uh, the graph, and as you go to the, uh, to the right, it dr goes up, does a little wiggle here, but as you keep going and get farther and further away from the origin, you're going to end up in the first quadrant. So that's what we're asking here. What quadrant do we start in? What quadrant do we end in? This one here is going to start in quadrant three, and then as we as we slide to the left, sorry, slide to the right here, we're going to move up the curve. We're going to drop back down, and it's going to fall into the fourth quadrant. So that's that's what we mean by end behavior. And then one final thing: turning points. So a turning point occurs when a graph changes direction from increasing to decreasing, or from decreasing to increasing. Now, um, we're going to call these turning points maximums or minimums on the function here. So we're going to take a look at kind of a repeat of that previous one. Bearing in mind here, when we glance at the graph, again, we read it left to right. Okay, we read it left to right. So the graph here starts in the third quadrant, and then it's almost like we've got like a little, a little cursor on the on the graph here that we're we're pressing the right arrow for and then the cur that as we press the right arrow and as the x coordinate gets larger what happens here is the little point's going to go up now when it gets to this point right here it changes directions instead of going up it's going to drop back down and then it's going to change directions here and go back up again okay so this is going to be our maximum because it's it's it, think about the y coordinates of all the points to the left and to the right of it this is going to be the largest one here. So that's what we were talking about up here. So turning points occur when there are maximums or minimums. So here's a maximum value, and then here there's this little minimum. We drop back down. This is the lowest point in this little area here, and then it goes back up again. Okay. For this one right here, as we look at this thing and kind of read it left to right, kind of pushing our little cursor along here, it's going to move up, 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 hit this point right here, and then it's going to start to come back down again. So there's my turning point. Okay, and so we're going to see in a little while here how the, the degree of the function influences the number of turning points.
But anyway, there you go. So there's a, a bunch of information about polynomials. Now we're going to talk about some specific questions and, and get you used to how these things are all related. Linear functions. All right, so to start our little exploration here, we're going to take a look at a constant function, which has a degree of 0. In this case, the specific example we're going to look at is y equals negative 2. Now, here's what the graph is going to look like. Basically, in this case right here, we've identified that the y coordinate is negative 2. Now, notice that there's no reference to x here. It doesn't matter what x is. x could be anything. It doesn't make any difference. The y coordinate is always going to be negative 2, meaning this is the dominant feature of this graph. This is the only like, significant thing to say here. That's going to look like this. Here's negative 1, here's negative 2. This is simply going to be a horizontal line that goes along where the y coordinate is negative 2. Okay, because this tells us that all y coordinates are negative 2. So let's come over here and talk about the characteristics. It's always going to be a horizontal graph, these constant functions. Uh, the x-intercept doesn't have one. Okay, and the majority of them won't have them. In fact, there's only one that would have an x-intercept. And that's y equals 0, which would just be the, the x-axis. The y-intercept, well, the y-intercept, think about this, all of the y-coordinates here are negative 2, so the y-intercept would be negative 2. My domain, well, it doesn't really matter what the x-coordinate is. y is always negative 2, so the domain's all reals. My range, though, however, Take a look at that graph again. Notice that this slides along horizontally, meaning it only ever hits one y-coordinate. So the range here is going to be just negative 2. End behavior? Well, it starts in quadrant 3. These Roman numerals there. And it's going to end in quadrant 4. It doesn't move up or down. It, it's, it just goes straight across here. So quadrant 3 to quadrant 4. And the number of turning points, well, it doesn't have any. It never changes directions. Okay, it's just a horizontal line. Okay, so that's in essence what a what a constant term is going to look like here. The only way these things differ, these these constant functions that differ, is is where they're located uh, along the coordinate plane here. So, for example, if it was y equals three, that would be up here at one, two, three. It'd be just straight across like that. That's all you need. All right in this next little. Uh, I guess row here in this table here, we're going to look at a linear function. It's got a degree 1. So here are two examples. Uh, now I want to talk really quickly about both of these. Now neither one of those is this guy right here. So I'm just going to kind of, ugh, let's ignore that. So this one right here has got a y-intercept of 3, positive 3. So it's going to go through here, 1, 2, 3. And then it's got a slope of 2, 2 over 1. Now remember, slope of 2. Slope is rise over run. So this is going to go up 2, 1, 2, and then just over 1. And I would connect those dots right there. So that's what that looks like. And when you've got a positive slope, you go up as you go to the right. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to move up like this. This one down here, the y-intercept is negative 3. So 1, 2, 3. And we've got a slope here of negative 1 half. Now remember, this is your rise over your run. Sometimes people get confused when there's a negative out front as to where to associate it. Uh, typically, you would associate with, uh, when we're talking about slope, you'd associate that with a numerator. It doesn't always have to be that way, but most of the time, that's, that's a pretty safe bet. It makes the most sense. So in this case, we're going to drop 1 and then go over 2. So down 1 over 2, and then we would connect those two right there. And notice that an, a line with a negative slope drops as you go to the right. And so here's, here's the summary of that. So graphs are always uh, diagonal lines. Now, actually, the word that we want to use here is not diagonal. We want to use the word oblique. Okay, but it's a good opportunity for us to talk about this. A diagonal, anytime you've got a polynomial, sorry, not polynomial, <laughs> polygon, okay, a diagonal is the line that goes from one corner over to the opposite one. That's a diagonal. But if you don't have... If you don't have a, a polygon around those points, then this isn't a diagonal. This is just what we would call oblique. Okay, a diagonal always has to be connecting two points inside a shape. But oblique, eh, that just simply means off at an angle. Positive slope rises to the right. Negative slope drops. Uh, whoa. Rises to the right. Slope falls to the left. No, no, falls to the right is what that means. 
falls to the right. And then the domain and range are always going to be all reals and all reals. Quadratic functions. All right, in this, this row here, we're going to look at quadratic functions, and those are degree two. And we've got two types here, so we'll just look at this, this one here, where the leading coefficient is positive. So meaning, the number in front of the squared term is going to be positive here. So in this case, it's positive 1x squared plus 2x minus 3. And when you've got a positive leading coefficient on a quadratic, it always does this. It always starts in quadrant 2, swoops down, and then ends in quadrant 1. It doesn't even really matter where the vertex is. We know it's going to start at some point. It's going to be over here to the left. If you go far enough, you're going to be in quadrant 2. And if you go far enough to the right, you will end up in quadrant 1. Okay. Uh, these parabolas, typically the way you describe them is they open up. Okay, that little bowl shape there. It's going to This uh, is going to contain a minimum value. Um, now, I guess in this particular case here, you would go look down at this here, and it looks like the minimum value here is negative 9. 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. So it would be like negative 9. Now, you'd have to read that off or go to your calculator and have your calculator find the minimum there, but that's that's what that is. It's the y-coordinate here, okay, of the vertex. Uh, when it comes to turning, uh, sorry, x-intercepts here, you can have you, uh, from zero x-intercepts up to a maximum of two x-intercepts. Now, notice that this guy hits the x-axis twice, but it is possible that we could have had a parabola that did this, that just hit it once, kind of came down, kind of bent, boom, hit the x-axis, and then bounced off again. But you can also have it so where it doesn't even touch it at all. This is only true if you've got an even power, an even degree. Odd degrees don't do this. The number of turning points is going to be 1, and it will have 1. Okay, Because of the square in there, it will have a turning point somewhere in there, but just 1. Uh, my domain is going to be all reals. And my range, particularly in this case, because it's positive and it opens up, the range is going to be greater than or equal to whatever the minimum value here is. And in this particular case, that's going to be negative 9. So my range would be y is greater than here. Let's make sure that's clear. Negative 9. Now let's take a look at this, this next one here, degree 2 again. But this time the leading coefficient is negative. And this, when you've got a quadratic with a negative leading coefficient, it's always going to start, if you move far enough over, it will always start in quadrant 3. It'll swoop up, drop down, and if you go far enough to the, to the right, you will always end up in quadrant 4. So this is always going to be true. Again, the graphs are parabolas that open down. Uh, in this case here, this contains a maximum value. Um, Oh, and I did that wrong up there. Okay, this contain a maximum value here. I misread the word at up there. I got to redo that. This contains, uh, sorry, has a, a maximum value at x equals 2. But the actual value here, the value is 4. Okay, so at 2, at x equals 2, it goes up and it hits the value of 4 here. Up here, uh, my mistake, sorry, I, I didn't read that quite carefully enough. This contains a minimum value at, and in this case it looks like be where x is equal to 1, and that minimum value is negative 9. That's a little different here. So it occurs at the x value. Now, at the given x value, because remember how this works. x, if you want to think of it in terms of like a like a, a scientific experiment, x is the manipulated variable. I control the x, and I'm just curious as to what's going on with the y. So I start with really small values of x, and then I make them get larger, and I swoop from left to right along the graph, and I'm just curious that when I do this what the smallest value is that my, my graph gets. So that occurs when x is equal to 1, and the minimum value is negative 9. Okay, now here, and again, this one contains just one turning point. And then same as before here, it'll have somewhere between 0 and 2 x-intercepts, just because it's quadratic. Cubic functions. All right, now finally for what we're working with, we're going to talk about cubics, so degree 3. And first of all, we'll start off with a, a cubic where the leading coefficient is positive. So here's an example. And I want you to know that you're going to move from quadrant 3 up to quadrant 1. It'll always work like this if you've got a positive cubic or positive odd degree. 
Now it's going to have this little bit of a twist to it. Now notice the parabola just had the one turning point, but the cubic is going to have up to three turning points. Okay, so over here where it says having two turning points, it should be up to two turning points. It can have less. It can, but it still has to go from quadrant three to quadrant one. So it is possible, for example, for this to have no turning points, not exactly the same way, where it's going to be increasing up to here and then continues to increase. But if it's got this little jog in it that kind of uh, slides over like that, it would still be a cubic. And you're just going to need to see some examples of this to really understand what I'm meaning here. But this is the general shape of that cubic, two distinct turning points. The domain and the range are both elements of the reals. Uh, when we talk about the number of x-intercepts, the minimum we can have here is one, okay? Because it might go through and then swoop up and then it never actually touches it again, okay? But because it drops down into quadrant three and goes up into quadrant one, at some point it must cross the x-axis. So you don't get the opportunity to have none. You could, however, have a situation where you've got two. It could come up, cross through, come back down and then just bounce off. Or it could have three like you're seeing in this graph right here. So it could have uh, from one up to a maximum of three x-intercepts and up to two turning points. If you've got a negative leading coefficient, and you can see that here. Now you'd have to expand this out to see the cubic, but you've got x times x times x, so I can see the cubic there. It's going to go from quadrant two this time to quadrant four. Basically it's dropping down as you move left to right. And then just like before, okay, uh, so we've mentioned the, the end behavior here. This is going to have uh, up to two turning points. Okay, up to two turning points. Uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> that's what that was right there. Up to, okay, this one here's got two, but it could have from, um, from zero up to two. Uh, sorry, up to two, yep. Because it's always going to be one less than your degree. Like a cubic could not have more than two turning points. And the degree here is three. And so there you go. That's what we're looking for. Fill in the open spaces in the following table. Okay, here we go. So we're going to answer some questions here. So first of all, let's run through this. We've got y equals 3 over 2x plus 1. y equals x squared minus 8x plus 12. And y equals x cubed minus 2x squared minus 3x. Okay. So first of all, the degree. Well, the degree is going to be the, the largest exponent on x. In this case, all I see is that x by itself, the exponent, if it's not written, is 1. So this is degree 1. So this is linear. Okay, actually, I'll do the leading coefficient as well here. The coefficient in front of that term is going to be 3 over 2. There we go. Here, the largest degree is going to be 2. So this is quadratic. And if there's no number written in front, we assume it's 1. So the leading, leading coefficient is 1. Similar sort of thing here, this is a cubic, and so the degree is 3, and then the number in front of the cubic term here is 1, so we just put it down as 1. Okay, what's the graph going to look like? Okay, well, this has got a y-intercept of plus 1, and then a slope of 3 halves, meaning from here I would have a rise of 3, 1, 2, 3, and then a run of 2, which would put it over there, so 1, 2, one, two. Now I would just connect the dots. So my, my function is going to look something like this. Uh, for this guy right here, uh, what I would do, there's a couple things i got to do. First of all, I'm going to factor this. And so factors of positive 12 that add to negative 8 would be negative 6 and negative 2. Okay, so my two x-intercepts here would be positive 6, positive 2. So uh, was that going to be 2 and then, and then 6? Now there's a cute little trick from math... Uh, 20-2, for figuring out the vertex here, so my two x-intercepts were 6 and 2, the average of those two is going to be 4. 6 plus 2 is, is 8, divided by 2 is 4. If you plug 4 into this, well, 4 minus 6 is negative 2, 4 minus 2 is positive 2, negative 2 times positive 2 is, is negative 4. So my vertex here is going to be the point 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 4, it's going to be down here and then the graph's going to open up. Over here, I would do a similar sort of thing. I would factor out the common x. 
Okay, and then I'm going to get x squared minus 2x minus 3. And this will become x times x, what is this going to be? Minus 3x plus uh, 1. And now with a cubic though, uh, the cubic's not going to have the same kind of max min points, or at least not absolutes. Okay, you'll have turning points here. Um, but at this point in time, I'm just going to kind of guess at how far up they go. It's, what's important here is I know that I'm going to have an x-intercept of 0, thanks to that factor right there. This is x minus 3, so I'm going to have a, a root of positive 3. And plus 1 is going to put a root of negative 1. And so this is now a positive cubic. Okay, the number in front of it is positive, so it's going up. And then it's going to come up through this point, back through that point, and up through this point right there. So it's going to look something like that. Now, my x-intercepts. Okay, well, my x-intercepts occur where the y-coordinate is equal to 0. So if I do that, if I make that 0 equals 3 over 2x plus 1, whoops, sorry, I can't see that, uh, bring the 1 over, be negative 1 is equal to 3 over 2 times x, multiply by 2, divide by 3 to get x by itself, and we'll get negative 3 halves is equal to x. That's my x-intercept. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry, not negative 3 halves. I, sorry, as soon as I said that, that didn't sound right. Negative 2 thirds. Yeah, negative 2 thirds. Because I'm multiplying up by 2 and then dividing by 3. Now, over here, in order for me to do this little sketch, I actually had to factor it. I grab my x intercepts right out of the factored form. They're going to be positive 6, positive 2. Positive 6, positive 2. Don't put brackets around that because that implies that that's a point. This is just a list of x-coordinates. Uh, here, my answer would be 0, positive 3, and negative 1. And again, I get that out of the factored form of this polynomial. Okay, x minus 0, meaning there's x is equal to 0. x minus 3 is equal to 0. x is equal to 3. x plus 1 equals 0. x is equal to negative 1. Now, the y-intercept. This is a little bit easier here because all I got to do is look at the constant term in the way it's written here. So this is going to be 1. This one will be 12. And because there's no constant term here, the answer is going to be 0. So here's going to be 1. This would be 12. And in the absence of a constant term, call that 0. And that's because our constant term was 1, our constant term was 12, and again, our constant term was 0. And that's they're just trying to make the link between those two lines there, between the y-intercept and the constant term. Okay, end behavior. Well, if you follow this thing to the left, follow it to the right, you're going to end up going from quadrant 3 up to quadrant 1. So 1, 2, 3, up to quadrant 1. Kind of if you go back and forth there. For this one here, uh, no, you're not seeing it right here, but if you were to extend this up here, this would go up and up and up, but it also moved to the left, and it would keep moving to the right here. So this is going to eventually end up in quadrant 2, and this part of it is going to stay in quadrant 1 forever. So this will be quadrant 2 up to quadrant 1, and that's how a positive quadratic behaves. This one here is going to be a, quad, uh, sorry, a positive cubic, and notice it starts low in quadrant 3, wiggles, and then goes up into quadrant 1. So 1, 2, 3, up to quadrant 1. That's its end behavior. Ah, okay, domain. Uh, domain is going to be the easy question because really, really, for polynomials here, uh, unless you're talking about a word problem where it's sort of restricted because of the limitations of the word problem, this is all going to be element of the reals. Okay, element of the reals. Now, usually you can't talk about the domain without talking about the range. If it's odd degree, you're going to get y as an element of the reals. Now, this is because it's odd degree. Now, I'm going to jump here because this was a quadratic. So I'm going to jump to this one right here. This was a cubic. So again, this is going to be y as an element of the reals because of the odd degree. Now, here though, this had an even degree. So let's take a quick look here. So this one dropped down, hit this point right here, the vertex, and then went back up. The minimum value that you got, 
Okay, and we figured that out here uh, just by plugging the that middle line there. Remember, the average between um, 6 and 2 was 4. If you plug 4 into that equation, it gives you negative 4. The lowest point here was negative 4. So every point on that graph is going to have a y-coordinate that's greater than or equal to negative 4. Or equal to uh, is when we're talking about the vertex. And now finally, the number of turning points. Well, with the linear, there were no turning points. Okay, actually, I probably I shouldn't do that. I should probably put the answer here. The number of turning points. Well, there were none. Here, for a quadratic, it turned directions once. And for my cubic, it I changed directions here and here. So it changed directions twice. Okay, so there you go. A really quick overview and uh, summary here of the, the properties of polynomial graphs.